Hi everyone, greetings from Berlin. I'm here together with uh, Adam Burns, one of our mentors at Dyn, and we will run you through a webinar that uh, we believe will be quite useful for your planning uh, phase. It is a technical webinar, but you do not need the deep technical understanding of all details. Uh, stand by with your friendly geek or have a look at it later on also online at the recording. What we are trying to do is walk you through the basic notions of networks and clients and servers and the possibilities of cryptography, end-to-end -end encryption, and generally how to plan your architecture so that you know where the data is who is uh, accessing it and who has data exposed and who doesn't and by what means. So we will also recommend you uh, technologies that actually we used and they are well tested in implementing such systems. So first of all, I start sharing uh, you my screen and I will uh, introduce you briefly to what we do at Dyn. You probably have heard about us if you are in the Ledger program. We will mentor you um, through the acceleration, so-called, through developing your uh, minimum viable product. And uh, we put a lot of hope in the fact that your project will be thriving. It's not our first time. We do community-based development. Uh, as a hacker community, ham radio amateurs, all sorts of geeks, nerds, uh, since the 94, organizing some sort of events like hack meeting, and stuff around Europe and beyond. Uh, nowadays, we are found ourselves in the, in the eyes of the European Commission as a good practice. And after having led the Decode project, we've been called to coach this uh, accelerator program. So the Decode project, uh, for those who haven't heard about, was uh, run in Amsterdam and Barcelona as two main pilot cities, led by coordinator Francesca Bria, aimed at putting data in control of people. So our slogan was really about uh, data sovereignty. About people in charge of data. Yes. Rather than the other way around. Thanks. Yeah. In fact, being in charge of your data, not, not Facebook, not uh, a foreign uh, uh, platform controlled by other means than actual the community decisions. So this is a step towards sovereignty in our uh, opinion, technical sovereignty and uh, I am focused particularly on algorithmic sovereignty, which is the sovereignty on what algorithms decide you should be seeing or not, uh, how you will be rated uh, in life, your credit, your, uh, your uh, price by an insurance, all these sort of mechanisms that govern nowadays our lives. So in Decode, we have been very pragmatic. We tried to actually uh, develop tools that communities can use to develop, to, to actually roll out platforms, community platforms that allow uh, digital sovereignty. This is not only a technical process, but it's also a political process. So everyone involved, there is a strong interdisciplinary approach needed. Uh, so not only community projects, but the, 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 the ideals are universal, like uh, privacy by design, you can have, um, data sovereignty and data autonomy by design within a project or yes. within a system. Yes. So, thanks. It's uh, indeed important to have a design approach um, rather than patch your system later. And this is the first lesson uh, in, in this architecture webinar. Uh, plan for participation by your community. Uh, choose some rules on how the community, the system will work and stick to them. Because the fact that rules, uh, I mean, they may be there, they may be agreed at the beginning, but if they stay the same, then there is a real democratic approach to it. So that rules are equal for everyone. And um, just make sure that the community is in charge, that there are ways for the community to actually choose where the project goes. So now down to the architecture, the technical architecture. We will talk about uh, the simple mail transport protocol, also known as SMTP. Why? Because I believe it's the last and only well-made distributed protocol that we have seen in the last 20 years. <laughs> Let's say everything else was bonkers. 
there are other attempts at doing a good distributed uh, architecture, but they are sort of marginal. If you consider the impact that email has of today has on our work, then you understand that this is a mass deployment. It is. It's, it's probably without doubt uh, the largest deployed federated networking system on the planet. Yeah. And what was special about it, what is special about it, is that you can run your own mail server. Now, forget about the fact that 90%, if not more, of the emails are hosted by a few multinational corporations. Initially, the protocol was thought for federation. What was eventually a problem was noise, spam, and the fact that people need to actually uh, administer their own attention by following only the data that is relevant to them, the information that is relevant, the communication that is relevant. But as a protocol and as an architecture has been always thought as open as possible. Mm. So if you have a large enough organization to provide quality of service, you can install your own mail server and have sovereignty about it. Yeah. Just as a quick aside, yeah. it's funny that the problem was uh, spam and unwanted uh, advertising based materials. And now, of course, the uh, majority of the email services offered by the big companies are by companies that offer advertising. Yeah. And but anyway, if yeah, some things may have gone better. The fact that uh, operating a mail server uh, uh, is fairly complex and you need also notions of domain name service administration uh, made it rather difficult for a single person, if not a technical person, to, to run it. But still, you may have worked uh, and are connected to organizations that run their own mail server or at least have their own domain. And, and the properties of the mail network mean that that each mail server has its own autonomy yeah. and speaks to each other as a peer uh, in in terms of resolving mail d delivery and transmission. Yeah. So let's get to that in detail. Indeed, uh, the way the system worked. I'm not sure you can see on the screen my my pointer, my mouse pointer. Describe the units and machine, end machine, end users machine. Um, anyone can help me to know? Do you see it? The mouse pointer? No, we don't see it. No, okay, it's just, just so I will just describe the, the thanks. So um, on the on the upper right, on yeah. the upper left, and the and the lower right you see the end user machine, which is a client. And in fact, that's what people use to write emails and send them. Now it's important to understand that these emails go to a server, which is your mail server, which will communicate to other mail servers, the emails. Why this was present in the protocol in the first place is that one server can be offline and a client may be online and offline intermittent different times. At different yeah. times. Yeah. So the mail server is a sort of postman that batches the emails and tries over time to send them, to deliver them to the recipients. So even if you put your, uh, your client offline or your mobile, for instance, nobody goes offline, the mail server will keep trying. Yeah. And you are still receiving mails, it's just you haven't received it locally yet. Yeah. yeah. They're so, getting closer to the destination. But yeah, not closer, reached. not reached. So you can pull them. And in fact, you have an availability which is granted by the server. This is an important function. If you think of data traveling around, uh, people uh, fetching it and, in, and, and sending it intermittently, you need to envision um, a sort of presence online that is continuous and has high reliability. Nowadays, this is solved by the cloud, but the cloud we can argue is not exactly in your control. It can be used, but uh, then with a layer of encryption. So coming back to this design, uh, please keep in mind, you will have clients interacting with databases, with, uh, with delivery engines that are highly available, 
And uh, eventually you can draw other sort of connections between the clients themselves. This is what a peer-to-peer -peer system is, in fact. When you build these connections, you have a situation of uh, uh, reliability that becomes different. The connection may be flaky, you may have a firewall in between, you may have problems to put those clients right in connection. Whereas it's easier to standardize the sort of connectivity that one has with the server and then let the, the data travel. Um, I like to say now, and to conclude this, this introduction to an architecture that works, that uh, nowadays we have uh, another dimension to this. Uh, the alternative for privacy is not only to either trust the server and send to a server all the data or connect the clients between themselves. We also have the opportunity to use encryption to build end-to-end -end encryption. Cryptography offers the way to conceal data so that only the recipient can see it and access it. Offering strong access control to the data. Yeah. And the data can be in the hands of anyone along the route. So you don't need to trust the server anymore if you do end-to-end -end encryption, which presumes the end-user machines have agreed, and the end-users have agreed on a password or have exchanged keys. We will get to that later, to how it works exactly. So now, um, if there are not urgent questions, there is a, a question and answer section coming up. Uh, but if you have urgent questions, feel free to interrupt. If not, we go on to talk about blockchain, which is a fairly modern, uh, very hyped, uh, and uh, oh my God, it's gonna save the world architecture, which is not gonna save the world unless we understand it very well. And um, well, I don't believe there is a technology that can save the world without a good plan. We're doing them without a good plan at the very least. So let's try to have a good plan about this, this deployment. In your projects, uh, some of you have been told by Miha and Andrea that have been running and are still running one-to-one -one sessions. You have uh, uh, some need for blockchains. Some of you have clear ideas about what a blockchain can do and what not. There are doubts between the difference uh, between a distributed ledger technology and a blockchain. So I will try to, uh, I will propose actually the framework we have developed in uh, Decode in order to think about this sort of technologies. And um, forgetting about the difference between names, we can usually call it DLT, distributed ledger technologies, blockchain, almost the same way. Um, I would like to focus on the four components which we individuate as forming, as constituting a blockchain uh, or a DLT. And these are the four components that you see on your screen. Let me comment briefly about them. One is the most uh, talked about, even gave uh, the name to our funding program, is Ledger. The Ledger is really nothing new. It's an accounting uh, practice to have a ledger in order to establish a balance. So you can see a ledger as simply as a list of transactions, or if you want uh, in a simple way, a plus or minus, a list of uh, additions and subtractions that forms a current balance and it's uh, up and only. So you cannot change the past, but you only add another transaction. So the balance will be the aggregation, so the sum of all those transactions. Contrary to another scheme in which you would have a database cell, like an Excel cell, that you fill up with a number and then you change the number. No, in this case, you have a full history with timestamps of the variations of that balance. And every time you want to actually calculate the balance, you operate all the transactions again and again. So this is really nothing new. What is maybe a little bit newer is the peer-to-peer -peer architecture. The fact that many um, mostly permissionless blockchains, the most famous and actually most reliable being Bitcoin, 
are running on a peer-to-peer -peer network is um, architectural, is a wise architectural choice because it allows people to actually run their own system and connect one-to-one. -one. But there is a but. Also in case of Bitcoin, you don't have so many people running full nodes. It ends up also being a problem for people to actually run your own node. It's not simple to deploy hardware, to actually make sure that a machine runs reliably into a place and that way make the place connected. So there can be, uh, there can be trade offs. You may want to have an encryption, uh, a strongly encrypted architecture relying on cloud services, or you may want to run an actual box at home or at the office or in the places that you want to connect. This is very much up to your project. In the first round of Ledger, we had two projects focusing uh, uh, closely on uh, box deployment, uh, Cobox and uh, Heimdall. Ah, yeah. and, uh, and this was part of their project. If you don't really care about running an infrastructure into a place, then you can still leverage some peer-to-peer -peer across servers. And we will see why that is useful. The other component of a blockchain is the virtual machine. And this is what we focus most of our development in Decode because Ledger, you have Ledger databases everywhere, Kafka being the most famous, but you can use any database really as a Ledger. And peer-to-peer uh, -peer is, well, you, have, you must have used some peer-to-peer -peer, -peer in your life. Who didn't download a BitTorrent or a Nutella or anything? But the virtual machine is what uh, most people starting from Satoshi actually struggled to make work for uh, covering a bunch of use cases. Um, a few people know that even Bitcoin had a smart contract uh, system that was called script and that had to be deactivated back in version 0 0.4 because it was broken and bugged mm -hmm. and actually made the whole network unreliable. Later on, Vitalik Buterin and, uh, and uh, other people came up with uh, uh, Ethereum, Ethereum, the EVM. Yeah. And that is a virtual machine that aims for consistency and implements a virtual CPU. So the first thing that went implementing was a assembler language made of opcodes, a very old school approach. So uh, basically what happened is that uh, there wasn't a lot of innovation after the EVM. We have some attempts at, at developing virtual machines, but we have seen also a big uh, uptake, uptake of that uh, script um, uh, technology. And we have seen several disasters. I don't know if you recall the, the smart contracts, some uh, bugs of Ethereum smart contracts were used to steal uh, investors' money <laughs> and uh, even the, the something horrible for a blockchain, the whole blockchain was rolled back to take back those investments, which is a basic break of, break of rules. Rewriting when, history. Yeah, rewriting history is not what you're supposed to do when you run on a blockchain system. So think about actually having it in your system because if you actually deploy it, you should not roll back history. That's a shame that I think will stay, stick with Ethereum for a long time. So uh, what, what happens with a virtual machine, what happened in our case is that we try to develop a virtual machine that offers very little space if, not, if known to errors in programming. And in order to do so, we made it uh, close, programmable, close to human-like language. So very human readable. Oh, and maybe, maybe we can just quickly go through what you mean by a virtual machine, because I think sometimes this term can be overloaded. That you mean a, a, a virtual machine in the sense that it's, it's an encapsulated uh, environment that, that, that can be run anywhere. It's not necessarily a, a virtual version of your laptop or, or, or anything else. It's, it's that portability that is the essential item of it. Yes. It's an isolation execution environment. Yeah. Okay. Let's say. It's a one could, it's right, because it's not a virtual machine in the sense of, uh, 
of an ISO image or a Vagrant or a, yeah. or a, yeah, or a it's VMware. More, it's more maybe like the concept of a Java virtual yeah. machine or, or, or yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's something that runs on pretty much every hardware, just mm. like uh, Java. It abstracts the hardware layer. Yeah. Actually, in our case, it doesn't even speak to the hardware layer and can be encapsulated into other languages. A host application, your own application, can uh, use this virtual machine inside. And if the virtual machine crashes, it will not be affected. So the virtual machine isolates the execution. Why? It's very important to understand. If you deploy on a blockchain, you have to be ready, if you make it uh, you know, proper, you have to be ready to accept and process untrusted code. Rule number one in secure programming, really. Yeah. Process your input. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard. Think of, uh, think of opening up your computer to any code that one can write and making sure that that computer will not be taken over. Opening up your laptop uh, to anyone in front of the keyboard. Yeah. It's Perhaps, another way of yeah. <laughs> Perhaps a very talented person that knows how to code something that will hide into your system or will explode a little bit later or will do anything. Anything that you don't want to be done to your system. And you open it up to the world and you say, do whatever you want. That's what uh, Bitcoin did, for instance, putting a big, big uh, bounty on it and uh, has resisted so far, which is, I think, as a remarkable experience and experiment. So and consensus. we get to consensus. Yeah. Uh, there we have the most advanced research, I think, as of today. Something that we covered less and something that we actually um, more, uh, more or less uh, delegated to other projects. It takes a full project to actually be in charge of a consensus um, and especially using a Byzantine fault tolerant consensus, which is for large enough. Now, what, yeah? I was just about to say, yeah. um, or ask at least, um, you're talking about the consensus of, of agreement in terms of writing this ledger. In other words, the, the consensus at the sort of root level of uh, what history gets written, so to speak, if yeah. you want to talk about that. that yes, way thanks. Let's itself. get more uh, concrete, indeed. Because uh, you could have contracts at a, at, at, at a lower level that require consensus and so on. But... It's about all the peers that are contributing to the ledger to reach a consensus and, and an agreement as to what's get written as history. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Indeed. What is the next step of the transaction in the ledger? Are we all agreeing the timestamp is the same? Are we all agreeing that this thing has happened after this yeah. thing? Yeah. This transaction has happened after, not before. Do we have all our clocks synchronized? <laughs> Uh, is there a liar in our network that says that someone else has sent something to someone else? And how do we find it out? <laughs> so the consensus algorithms are part of complex networking uh, classes in, in universities and are pretty advanced and, and uh, difficult to master. Fortunately, we have different scenarios. And in our cases, you have really to think twice before applying a big consensus mechanism to your project. Maybe you, it's enough for you to have replication and trusted peers. In that case, you, you do a permissioned um, sort of blockchain. That will not be anymore an open world system, but there are some projects that actually ended up implementing that rather than yeah. exposing themselves. So there will be a variety of requirements, of course, for each project. Some people will possibly, and perhaps quite likely, um, outsource a lot of the ledger um, to existing open source projects, yes. what, what, whatever the choice of the ledger and consensus network system is, yet others might have uh, requirements for tuning some of their own componentry within that network. Yeah, and uh, indeed. But in either case, it's probably a very good idea to understand either what you're getting into by accepting yeah. a particular technology instance or indeed rolling your own. Yeah, yeah. it's very important. And uh, well, I think that the best approach you mentioned is like if you think that your system will scale, 
you can attach it to an existing uh, consensus network. You can build your own ledger attached to it, what is called pegging uh, to, to a blockchain. And um, rolling out your own, it means you really have a, a, a size and that you have people that will join the community and run nodes and you don't need to authenticate them. You just want anyone in the world to just starting running a node for your project. So before going for that, imagine that your project really will actually have this impact in the world. If it doesn't, it's not a problem. Just redimension your expectations and plans of architecture. So for running this sort of uh, nodes, going back to the fact that you may want to deploy hardware, hardware machines, uh, we have developed within Decode, and it's our one of the biggest right now community developments we have done at Dyn, uh, an operating system called DevOne, which is now completely run by a community of people. Our focus has been to keep Debian simple. The Linux uh, desktop systems have taken a little bit over development. So lately, there has been changes in, in GNU Linux systems that went into the direction of providing people a touch uh, interface or a desktop experience at par with mainstream desktop programs. We thought that the most important usage of GNU Linux in, in our professional world is that on embedded devices and on microservices and virtual platforms. So in this case, running your server on a GNU Linux machine the less is better. Minimalism wins. So you need just the function that you need and not any other function. Uh, you don't need to deal with third-party software that manages your computer. You can sometimes run just one. one yeah, process. and of course these tiny devices uh, have less need of uh, dynamic systems. You know, you plug a USB keyboard or a sound device into it. Well, it's just a small IoT device. This is not likely to happen, nor is it within its design parameters no. to have happen. So they cut, cut it down for simplicity and uh, reliability. Yes. Uh, Jaramil, sorry, there is a black uh, uh, rectangle on your screen, on the right oh. side of your screen. Probably that. Yeah. Has it moved? Has it yeah, moved? It has moved, yes. If you could hide it, it would be better. Would be better. Oh, yeah. let me see. Yes. Yes, like this. Perfect. Thanks. So in case of this distribution, um, you can have a look. Um, you don't have to use this, but we do have knowledge in Dyn and we can directly interact with upstream developers on it. It's a community run, so there is a forum on dev1galaxy.org. Um, you can look it up. And uh, we ported it to more than 30 ARM devices, including Raspberry. As well, uh, it will also run in, uh, in cloud appliances. Virtual machines in Docker, uh, style in Docker containers, yeah. uh, and on in, you know, quite tiny embedded devices. So uh, it can be seen if you're, if you're cloud cognizant, it can be seen as uh, an equivalent, if not smaller footprint uh, distribution to uh, something like Alpine Linux. Very small, very cut down. Won't go into the details right now. Um, but, no, but um, good to mention. Yeah, um, it can be yeah. used within cloud environments all the way down to the edge IoT. Yeah, and it's not, I think, a coincidence that Alpine is even more famous than that one, more used, is one of the, uh, well, the, the main distributions used in microservice online. The reason is Alpine is minimalistic, it is small, yeah. it has uh, even cut off the packaging management, it uses BusyBox as a core instead of Nulibc, uh, Moozle. It has a lot of very tiny uh, details that make it uh, a, a fantastic clockwork. Yeah, okay. We went uh, developing on top of that one, something further for Decode. And this is part of our plan for privacy by design. It's called the Decode OS. And this is something that we would really like you to have a look. And uh, along the way, we will publish uh, a little bit more of a usable setup uh, that I will make sure you, you are informed about. We are working on, on now a publication for the, for the next ledger round. 
uh, with some bug fixes and modernities. But the, the gist of it is a microservice that runs as a cloud in Tor hidden services. So if you're not familiar with Tor, Tor is a project that is not just used for by people to hide themselves online, but to protect their privacy when they visit a website, which is very important if you consider the range of monitoring that is being done by our behavior online. So it provides anonymity for people to browse online, but it also provides anonymity for service pr provision inside the Tor network. So both ends of the client-server relationship are um, yeah. precluded from view. So we did um, a setup, which is easily tried via Docker. And uh, the setup is uh, comprised of a Tor service that runs uh, right away, plug it in, with Tordam, a little software we developed in Go that runs inside the service and handshakes with other DecodeOS units through Tor. So you fire up a unit, it connects all other microservices. Right, so, yeah, so it's, it's, it's like a peer-to-peer -peer convergence of like-minded yeah. uh, computing units. Yeah. yeah, okay. And it connects behind firewalls, so you don't need to have a hard setup to put up this machine in some in some office or anywhere, it just pierces through the firewall and gets in touch with the other instances. And they can communicate in between. There, you can run your own application. You can develop it in whatever language you want, Node.js, Python, Rust, whatever you want. PHP, basic, uh, basic Pascal. <laughs> we, Not really. Okay. Maybe Cobble, someone uh, may try no. Cobble. Okay. As long as you connect with SOX 5 and talk to other nodes. The Decode OS provides you with a database, a Redis, simple key value store, where you can see the addresses, the onion addresses of other instances. So you can handshake directly into your application. Yeah, so a bit like a BitTorrent list of peers that, yeah. that come up in your client you, as you see it transfer. Yeah, yeah. So and you can start with a tracker and then the tracker will list the first three peers and they will connect and know about each other. Yeah. So okay. you can use it as a container for your peer-to-peer -peer application. So it's a, it's a really good leverage to, to begin this, yeah. this architectural yeah. You can just start, uh, yeah. yeah. Because, to evaluate. Yeah, it's very complex. Once you get a lot of nodes, this you can test with deco the Docker Compose. We, we, we benchmarked it with a thousand of nodes in a virtual machine. Mm -hmm. It actually runs, and then you have to develop your application logic to make your different instances talk to each other. In well, that's, ways. that's part of the design of the application for microservices in the first place. Really. Yes. Yeah. So let's talk to each other. Do you have any doubts, questions? Or any topics that we've missed perhaps that, that you would like to concentrate on? Are you convinced about what we just said? We take your input now. Oh, guys, there were questions that have been asked before. I'm uh, Manolis has a, has a good one about RPFS. Yeah, Manolis writes, depends on what's next. Hello. So, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just realized I didn't mute. Um, I was wondering if you can speak a little bit about IPFS and whether it is a suitable uh, technology for any of us who wants to store information there. And more specifically in our case, we want to store sensor data uh, from our customers. Sensitive data. Sensitive data. Not, not sensitive, sorry, sensor, IoT data. Um, sensor data. Uh, oh, sensor data, yeah. Sorry, from data coming from sensors on the field. Well, so time series data, which means a, lot, a large volume of data. Yeah. And uh, Jaramil, I think that uh, while replying this, you might as well uh, go a little bit wider, wider on the subject and uh, explain uh, what, when it makes sense to use a database, when it makes sense to use a blockchain, when it makes sense to use a distributed ledger that is not a blockchain, like for example, Corda. I just learned that Corda is not a blockchain, but it is only a distributed ledger. Uh, when it makes sense to store hash data, when it makes sense to when store get data, there. That's the second part of the presentation. Perfect. But about IPFS. 
Yeah, IPFS uh, is, is, is one of the new emerging standards for distributed file storage. Um, there's IPFS and there's another project called DAT, which has a lot of similarities yeah. to IPFS. Um, the way I think of it, and it might even be wrong, please correct me if you, if you know, but I see it as very much like a, a local cached uh, file system with a lot of peer uh, peer to peer involvement itself. So it's like a peer to peer file system arrangement. Um, whether you want to store large amounts of data on IPFS, I'm not sure how well that will work out and scale. I think uh, you, you may find uh, local limits very quickly, and you may find your data being happened, having to be written. Uh, topologically remotely from where you are very quickly. And if you're talking about networks that um, of, of IoT devices, I think the, the, the network distance, the, some of the advantages of the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, topology of IPFS may well be lost through the topology and the amount of data that you're trying to transmit. But I think Further details, I think, might be best taken offline to this particular talk because it gets very specific on some of the storage um, technologies. Yeah. But I, I think the, the, the answer is uh, sort of maybe, but if you're thinking of huge amounts of data storage on IPFS, then I would start to consider uh, the sanity of that choice and perhaps there are other more reliable um, more available and more um, more resilient uh, solutions. Yeah, what's the size and the frequency of this sensor data and what is the, the lifespan? So let's, to keep the, our use case uh, simple, let's say we wanna store weather data coming from a weather station um, that is deployed on, on a farmer's uh, field. Um, so, there is a company, I shared the link in the chat. There is a company that is wor working on weather index. Uh, they're doing weather. Um, but what is the frequency? Uh, so weather, weather reports are, let's say, every 10 or 10 minutes of an hour? Yeah. So ideally, if... The lifespan? So how well, long you have permanent. to... Permanent. Permanent. Yeah. Okay. Then I wouldn't use IPFS. I would use it as as you would as you could use um, a glassier sort of uh, solution to store historical data, maybe. But it's it's not really. I mean, I'd rather develop an application that handles this data, input and output, and saves it on a database, which is something uh, something you can do also with API Room, that you will be shown by by Andrea in another webinar, and and so on and so forth. But uh, I wouldn't use IPFS for that. And uh, Adam agrees with me. Yeah. We are running a little bit late. We have 15 minutes for the next part. So any other question? I have a question. How, how are your developments connected to the self-sovereign identity uh, developments of uh, uh, Solid and all these uh, decentralized identity developments? Okay, we'll get there. Good also. question. Good question. Yes, uh, we get there in uh, uh, the Crypto Wonderland. Part two. So, <laughs> part two. Uh, yes, thank you for introducing it. Actually, we do have a lot of fun with uh, this sort of stuff. Uh, we are um, developing all sorts of things also in collaboration with people that want disposable identity uh, or ephemeral, ephemeral temporary like trash your own identity, like, you know, just what, yeah. why identity at all? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, uh, some of the extremes include, you know, well, uh, can't I just give my identity to someone else? Why yeah. not? Yeah, or pass and it on. Questionings of, yeah. of, of these identities. It's so what, what is really identity used for is authentication and usually identification in some transactions. So let's have a deconstructionist approach here. And first of all, I would like to put forward certain characteristics that we implemented in Zerum very quickly. We implemented them because of an urgency that I think is well described by the LangSec um, project. 
we wanted to have a non-Turing complete input language for reasons that I explained previously also to be able to actually process language without being afraid of it, even if it's a, a transformation that it's not desirable, it will not break your system. And then we want to have full recognition before processing. So we want to actually recognize the data that gets in before processing it. We want to validate its schema. We want to make sure that the data has its own integrity and can be processed in the system. Why many systems haven't done this so far? We don't know why. No, it's, yeah, terrible. Yeah. it's terrible. Mm -hmm. Anyway, in Zenroom, we have smart contracts in human language inside a virtual machine with a domain specific approach. So you have only certain statements processed and they are processing the state, the, this, the data and the code in a way that you can produce several cryptographic transformations. So to conclude about the approach we use with this component and why we are proposing it to you, why its development was funded by the European Commission and why Decode became a flagship project by publishing them. It's because it has a very novel approach to language theoretical security. So you do have quite some solidity that is designed inside the system when you use it, contrary to a library that can change, that may deprecate some calls. Uh, we, we, we provide Zenroom as a standalone bytecode with no dependencies. So we give warranty that runs very, very long in time in the future. It has controlled execution of cryptographic operations on data, so it doesn't breaks your hub, your, 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 your system application, your platform. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't spills out if there is a poisonous code. It has a so determin isolation. Yeah, yeah, it's isolation. Yeah. It has a deterministic and portable uh, uh, implementation. It means that given the same inputs and the same random seed, it will produce always the same output which is fundamental for blockchain operations. Especially in larger environments that uh, such peer-to-peer -peer operations have, yeah. and especially across heterogeneous platforms, no matter what platform you're running on, no matter where it is, no matter what state it's in, yeah. the same input should give the same output no matter yeah. where you do it yeah. or how you do so it. So if you're being in engineering peer-to-peer -peer or end-to-end -end encryption systems, you know, that when you run, yeah, it's the same library, but you run some library on in JavaScript inside a browser, which you want to do end-to-end -end encryption. Mm -hmm. So you have a JavaScript version of the library and you run the same library on a machine, on an Apple, and then on a Windows, and then you run it inside a Python program, given the same input, it will be very hard to have the same output. It's not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. Not only are there uh, bizarre edge cases that there are known issues yeah. in, in this sort of ubiquity of determinism. And that end-to-end -end encryption requires that determinism. So we made it very portable. You can NPM install Zenroom, you can pip install Zenroom, you can install it uh, pretty much in every language and you will have the same result inside the virtual machine. And it lets cryptographers and programmers work in parallel. This is in our organization of work in your team. Uh, also in our interaction is very we do have uh, uh, cryptographic expertise down to the level we could help you sketch new or, or you know, like remodel existing cryptographic novel. schemes, novel yeah. cryptographic schemes tailored for your application, giving you an edge on actual, you know, soft, self sovereign identity and so on, so far and so forth. But uh, we need to work in parallel in that case. You need to proceed as programmers, integrators, developers, and designers. And we can, let's say, give you a firmware that is uploaded or upgrades the, the implementation. And this is possible, is made possible by itself. So now down to the encryption level, you will have an introduction on Zencode language and API room later on. But now I just explain you, we, we are trying to explain you the architecture of this basic component that would be cryptography in your program. This is a base cryptographic situation a scenario in which you encrypt a message with a password. So we schematize it in a, in a, in a it, this is called section diagram, I think, or a step diagram, or I don't remember. It's 
it's uh, in uh, four, five phases. You see, there are two people, Anon one and two. So uh, the first one thinks of a secret password, tells this password to a friend, Anon two. Then in, in another time and, and place, perhaps, the password is kept. It will encrypt a message with the password, will send the secret message to the friend, and the friend decrypts the secret message with the password. So this should be clear to you. It's a simple way to encrypt. There is a password that actually encloses, encrypts a message and can be used to decrypt it. Of course, the weak spot is tell the password to a friend. We can have a middleman there, a man in the middle, so-called, that listens and steals this password so can tap into all further communications. This is a weakness and it was overcome about 30 years ago by Biffy, a lovely hippie traveling through the US interviewing uh, mathematicians if something like Diffy Hellman was possible. So we have a different scheme nowadays, which is called public private key encryption which was implemented in, you recall, our uh, simple mail tr uh, transport protocol scheme by uh, Philip Zimmerman as PGP, pretty good privacy. It's an additional layer of privacy on a channel of communication that does not exposes the exchange of a password. How does it work? We have Alice and Bob, now back to basics of cryptography. Alice creates a key pair, and publishes her public key to Bob. Bob creates a keeper and gives his public key to Alice. In this, in this scheme, the creation of a keeper includes the creation of a secret key and a public key. Only the public key is communicated. And this way, Alice and Bob can recompose, can extract basically a, a, a secret in between them by composing their secret key with the other person public key. So you never give your secret key away, your private key stays with you, and then you publish a public key. The combination of someone's private key with your public key will lead always to the same result, which is the secret between you and that person. Yeah, deterministic. Yeah. Deterministic. Within a scope. Yeah. Within a scope but you have never communicated your secret key. So there is no, no problem of interception in between these rules. No. What can we do with this? We can actually send secret messages this way. Alice will prepare her keyring, will encrypt a message, will send a secret message, and Bob on his own side will prepare the keyring and decrypt the message. Okay. The only communicated thing will be public keys as before and the secret message. Same thing, we can sign messages with this, uh, with this uh, situation. We can sign messages, Alice, send the signed message, and Bob can prepare the keyring and verify the signature. Okay, and for those that don't know, signing is um, uh, to integrity what encryption is to access control. Yes, so you can check that the message has not been tampered with. In any way. It's original, it's signed. Only one letter change, and the signature is invalid. We'll tell you actually that the whole message is changed. So something, something way more valid than, than this scribbling on a paper that uh, unfortunately most institutions uh, take as valid. Okay, now this is the interesting bit. Now we get to the core with the same description to what you asked um, one of the participants. Uh, sorry, you didn't say your name. You're there. Um, that you asked about how to uh, actually uh, use this use this technology stack within the ledger yeah. self sovereign identity. Yeah. It's uh, Peter Volgamut. <laughs> what? Peter. Yeah. Peter, Peter. Volgamut. <laughs> Hi, Peter. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Uh, what, what you asked about self sovereign identity, I believe it can be explained in a very uh, like down to earth way. Uh, with the use of credentials and blind credential proofs, also called zero knowledge proofs that we implemented in Decode uh, using Zencode. And this is the scheme. 
So you have a holder, a issuer, and a blockchain. Let's say or, the blockchain. Or a DLT indeed. Or a DLT. Yeah. The blockchain is the public space. Anyone can see what is published on that vertical. A holder and an issuer are the people that are requesting a credential, so are requesting an identity issuance, and the issuer is the one that signs that identity, that once and for all, perhaps, says, okay, this, this attribute of this identity, we like to think of attributes, not of a unique identity, this attribute is true. Let's say I declare I am 18 years old. So if you do that declaration, you are almost like an issuer and a holder together. Yeah, you can. Yeah. But also you can have another person checking, of course. you know, yeah. checking your document and saying, yes, you are 18 years old indeed. So can you, instead of saying, can you sign my photo and everything about this? You can say, okay, can you sign my credential? About one specific uh, attribute. element or attribute of your yeah. Yeah, identity. Yes. And so you will uh, create a credential keeper, as you see. Uh, uh, you will send a credential request to the issuer. The issuer will reply you, will check that your request is true. Please sign this credential. I am more than 18 years old. And the issuer will reply with the credential signature. From there on, the holder takes the credential signatures. They can be multiple, so we'll aggregate them. You can also ask multiple issuers. And from there on, the holder will be in possession of a credential that can produce zero knowledge proofs. So there's no more need for any communication with the issuer from that point. Yeah. So from that point, independently, a, a holder and um, a third party, because the holder can show this credential to someone and the third party can independently verify the proof, I think in like in point seven on yes. the diagram. Yeah. Yes. So, so there's no... Uh, mediation from that point at all. You're, you've got your sovereignty in that sense of yeah. that credential. And every time you show that proof, the proof is different. That's the magic of crypto. So every time you publish on the blockchain, the proof that, yes, it's me, 18 years old, give me that beer at the bar. Uh, the next time you show it, it will not be the same. So you cannot be followed. Okay, so the yeah, time-based, um, yeah, so the, what's it, perfect, not perfect forward secrecy, if you will, in yeah, some Yeah, it's zero-knowledge proof. Yeah. So you prove that you possess that attribute, but you don't show the very attribute. You cannot be followed. So every interaction in which you publish on the blockchain, is your, autonomous. your identity is autonomous, and it's, it's not, cannot be connected to your next publication <laughs> in a public space. Imagine if Alice lost in Wonderland can, can enter any room with uh, a, little, a little piece of paper. Everyone that enters in the room is asked to leave this piece of paper in a basket to prove their authenticity, their, the fact that they can enter in that room. Whoever checks that, uh, that basket will count uh, valid authentications, will count the people, but will not know whom this authentication belongs. Even if this person discovers whom this authentication belongs, the next time it will be shown it's in a new room, it will be different. So you cannot follow these people by collecting baskets. Even with prior protests. knowledge from the previous room. Yeah, yeah, even with prior knowledge. So you become uh, quite well self-sovereign. Also, uh, consider, I mean, in this case, sovereignty can be debated, is also defined by some protocols now in the W3C uh, DID uh, document, which we are working on to implement in Zencode. In this case, you can have multiple issuers as well. Yes. You can have a threshold of issuers. You can have five out of nine because issuers may disappear, die, or not be available. So, so for, for, verification of attributes issuers issuers are like uh, trust routes in a sense and and each person can choose uh, which trust route that they trust for a, a driver's license you might trust the driving authority yeah etc etc yeah exactly so we use this uh, in uh, pretty funny use cases i think uh, the funniest was in amsterdam 
where we run a pilot for kids to be able to buy their beer if they are above 18 years old at the bar without showing their ID. Fun. I think it's a human right to have beer above 18 years old. I had a little bit before that actually myself. It was fun. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's how it looks like. Um, that's code actually. And this is not up to date code. Uh, you will see examples again in, uh, in the next webinars, but you see that this code has variables. They are in uh, yellow and it has uh, basically English language that uh, describes all these operations that we have been shown. What this code produces inside Xevron is uh, it reads a JSON data structure and it prints out another JSON data structure that you can use in the next contract. Mm. So you build a flow that is very easy to show and understand yourself if you are a developer integrating this into your program, you know that on one end point you are authenticating on the other one this and that. And you don't have to worry that the JSON will break your, your application. It will be invalid, it will not be processed, but you can expose your API point to the world. And you will see that we did. We have a, a public service now called apiroom.net, which uh, we will show and use to actually, um, well, uh, drive you through the journey of developing uh, a crypto application. Any questions about all this? This is the last Q&A and then we are done for the webinar today. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Hi, hi this is Teresa from Leaf. I have a quick question back to the example you just gave on the 18 years old. Um, so what the, I guess the, my question is the process by which you uh, actually prove that that person is 18 years old in the first instance has to happen outside the blockchain and the encryption. So I don't know if it would be like a public officer who actually needs to approve your identity. So therefore, afterwards, you can actually transact with that. Yes, Teresa, indeed, spot on. Absolutely was that. And in case of the pilot in Amsterdam, uh, the city of Amsterdam, uh, um, a bright team that operated with us during the Decode project, developed a open source passport reader, which you find on the, on the GitHub repository of the city of Amsterdam, uh, running on a Raspberry Pi. So they connected the webcam to, um, to a reader uh, because you have to read the code on the password An to the NFC crypt. reader. NFC reader. And camera. Uh, and camera. Yes, it's, it's, it's quite a, an amazing little box. Yeah. Uh, shown off at the uh, final symposium. Yeah. The decode. There is also a video online on the Dynorg channel on YouTube that uh, shows the, the demonstration. So you have this passport reader, which we made completely open source. So take that military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. They could just build it with Raspberry Pis. Question your government about how much money goes to foreign military organizations for passport readers. And uh, once this was used, it emitted a credential that could be used anonymously this way. So as you correctly understand, this is a side channel, is another moment. Yeah. In the moment in which you do the issuance, then later on, you can use that. And I, I think, uh, and please uh, forgive me if I've misunderstood, but I think also the process that is used by an issuer is part of the trust imbued from that issuer and communicated. Yeah. So if, if a credential is uh, issued by a country in the form of passport, you, you decide whether that that uh, credential signed by that issuer is sufficient or yeah. valid for whatever reasons yeah. you find uh, by your policy or requirements yeah. to be good enough. Yeah. So you're completely sovereign because you decide also what is the attribute that you're signing. Yeah. It yeah. could be but 16 I mean, years old and who is signing it? Yeah. One or more issuers and whom I trust. Mm. And uh, we're working also on revocation, of course, of those uh, credentials by issuers, but this will be also distributed. So you can decide as a verifier on the blockchain if you want to accept something or not by issuer or UID. So it is a sovereign system in, in terms of whom you decide to trust. Thank you.
Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, this is Peter from Gene Coop again. A great explanation. Now I understand better the relationship with self-sovereign identity. Um, my question is uh, also uh, with the Decode project and so on. What is the reason that this isn't going exponentially now? Because I think all the technology and also the principles are there. Uh, also the networks for the developers are there. But why isn't it going to the next step? Because, uh, I, yeah, this is such a great model, such a simple model as well. So why isn't it going exponential? Well, thanks, Peter. Um, it is going exponential thanks to you and your projects. That's the plan. <laughs> so we hope that uh, your success will be that of exponential curve. We uh, really hope that. Uh, we are not uh, having... Uh, um, uh, you know, any ambition to be on top of the hill as, as a company or a multinational corporation by, by selling one solution to rule them all. We hope this component will help you build something fantastic. But this fantastic is not made by a technology, is made by your ideas, your users, your participants actually, your context, and where you want to graft your project. So that's your task now to build a, mod, a minimum viable product that makes that exponential that curve. That's probably not the answer he was looking for. No, so, but <laughs> now you feel all the responsibility. <laughs> right. And, uh, it's, yes. It, it is part of it. Yeah, it's yeah. part of it. And uh, another detail that may help you understand how much exponential and which direction this technology went is the fact that uh, four of the people that worked uh, with us on, on the actual implementation that you see of this cryptography has been hired by Google, by Facebook uh, to actually uh, develop the Libra concept right after the code. So you see that the multinational corporations that we are trying to, to uh, well, uh, block from having all our data and control all our memory decisions and identification and authentication processes they are actively looking into the exponential uh, potential of what we are developing and exploiting it because they are in advantage. There are strong concerns about this in, in Europe and they are concretely uh, visible by, by fines and policies that the European Commission is studying it nowadays. But in the meantime, what we like to do is to look at the bright side and really see something taking up with this technology in, in, in Europe. So that's what, again, what we hope you will do. With our help, we can do it together and we will not leave you alone after this Ledger project if, if, uh, if we come really to see that the potential is high from your project, you will receive a lot more su support from a lot of people that want to see this deployed. Great, thank you. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Okay, then thank you very much. And um, be sure we will stay in touch. And thanks Andrea and Miha for hosting and coaching this new group. Absolutely. I am not mentioning uh, uh, so far how sad I am that we cannot meet in person. We had the boot camps uh, in, in person the last year. We'll see when this will be possible. Uh, but for the rest, I hope we can actually uh, keep our focus up and build a, a good interaction also from distance.